Okay, now, praise God. Thank you all for joining us today. God is such a tremendous God, uh, and it's so beautiful to be able to come together, even though we are not, again, physically together. We are together in the spirit uh, with one mind, one baptism, one faith, one spirit uh, that works all in all. And so, you know, it is uh, the, the worship was fantastic as well. And really tremendous in um, explaining why we serve the God we serve. Uh, it's heartfelt. Uh, how many of us do feel desperate for God? Are we desperate for God? In other words, do we realize our depravity and the world's depravity? Uh, we can certainly see it every day without God, without Jesus Christ in their personal lives it is reflected in the world without christ and then of course those with christ it is reflected as well the life that we can live the everlasting life that we can live the abundant life that we can live today with christ in our lives so um this is um a time today to talk about walking in agreement and uh the lord just uh impressed upon me uh these scriptures and uh, the understanding and the importance of of walking in agreement walking together uh particularly couples how do you how are you how will you walk in agreement and uh this is not just for for husbands and wives or spouses this is also for the church this is for the church how do we as individuals walk in agreement with each other with the body uh, this is very very important so uh, amos and this is what god intend intends this is what god intended this is what god planned and plans for his church that for his body, for his bride, that they will walk in agreement. And um, in Amos 3.3, 3, we started out, uh, uh, and this is all English Standard Version, unless I, I specify otherwise. Uh, there are a few scriptures today in King James Version, but he says, do two walk together in Amos 3.3, 3, do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet. Just like uh, we said a couple weeks ago, if you're planning to go to a coffee shop and meet a friend, you get on the phone, you text, call, whatever, and say, you know what, let's meet at the coffee shop at such and such, a, such, a, such a time. And so then you agree to that and then you meet at that time. But um, as the Lord has given me uh, another understanding of this and that is uh, in marriage and so we reflected <clears throat> that uh, when you're married is it always easy to find agreement is it always easy to walk in agreement and walk together and uh, so how do we find that how is it going to happen because it is a challenge um uh, being individuals being unique being from different uh, upbringings different thinking different philosophies of raising children and uh different maybe religious backgrounds and maybe different cultural backgrounds and race all of these things are playing into um actually a a force driving people away driving agreement away and making it much more challenging to walk in agreement. And so how is it going to happen? And so we, we took a few examples, first of all, of people walking in agreement, but not necessarily walking in the right way or walking in the right agreement. And uh, so we looked at Abraham and how he went into Egypt and him and Sarah agreed to lie to the Pharaoh. And, um, and we saw the consequences to that. 
then we went on to to see Adam and Eve and how they agreed together to eat of the apple. I mean, it, I mean, Eve ate and Adam agreed and ate and joined in. And we see the consequences to that. Then um, we saw um, Ananias and Sapphira in the in the two in the New Testament how they sold their property and they agreed to tell the apostle that that was the full value of the property when it was not and we saw the consequences to that and so um, we also saw um, in Acts how uh, and let me just uh, catch up here to my notes and sorry so in acts chapter four he says now the full number of those who believe jacks chapter four um this is english standard version this is uh verse 32 now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own but they had everything in common and we'll come we'll come back to that in a moment um let's go back to abraham sarah isaac ishmael and hagar we're going to, going to go back to the account there and back into genesis uh, chapter 21, and we're going to start from verse 1. Genesis chapter 21, uh, starting from verse 1. Uh, we're going to read all the way down to 21. Um, this is such an important account um, to investigate, to study, to understand. And so uh, starting from verse 1, he says here, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did to Sarah as he had promised. Um, please notice that line, the Lord visited Sarah, wasn't uh, simply Abraham, um, but it was the Lord. It reminds me very much of, ha of um, Hannah when she was barren and she could not have children. Um, she cried, went to the temple and cried, and she was in such agony, she couldn't even utter it. She was mur muttering, and, and, Eli, and Eli saw her there and prayed over her and sent her home, and she bore Samuel, the great prophet. And uh, it reminds me of that. It reminds me a little bit of Mary, who never knew a man, but it was the Holy Spirit that uh that touched her womb and she conceived this is as miraculous as that because sarah was up in age she was in her 90s by this time in her 90s <laughs> by this time and she had never had a child it's one thing if you had had children you know and maybe uh you know happenstance or whatever you have a child in your 90s. I mean, it's it's unheard of, but it, it would be more likely, you know? Yeah, she had a fertile womb and she had, not only did she not have, uh, not only did she have um, a child in her old age, but she had never ever had a child. Her womb was never fertile. This is miraculous, even more so. And the Lord did to Sarah as he promised. And so we see what God's promised is uh, have to come to pass. They have to be fulfilled. I remember um, the Lord saying, though, that um, without faith, without Sarah's faith. Now, remember when we read earlier or a couple of weeks ago in Genesis that Sarah laughed when she heard it. She laughed when 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 the Lord had come or or the angel, I'm not uh, not 100 sure if it was Jesus himself or it was an angel, but um, when she heard that she's supposed to have a child, she laughed in herself and said, "How can this be?" But here we see that she had the child, and Sarah conceived and bore Abraham in verse two a son in his in his old age at the time of which God 
had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. A hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. And Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh over me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? So it wasn't just her having a child. She had to produce milk as well and had to nurse her son. I mean, this is just incredible that Sarah would nurse child. Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Let us take this on um, in, any, in, in every promise that God has promised us for ourselves. Because it, it's, it, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That power has never diminished, that ability, that focus on his people, the promises that he makes, he watches over to make sure that they are fulfilled. And he fulfilled this promise, and he will fulfill every promise that he has made to you and I. I believe that with one with all of my heart. And Sarah could not have conceived if faith did not arise in her. God would not allow it. God would not allow her to and, and, and would not be able to work in her womb if she did not have the faith. So when, from, from that point where she laughed about it to, to the point that she conceived, something changed in her. And she came to agree with the promise. She came to agree with God and what he had spoken and it's no different today. Every promise that is conceived will be conceived because faith arose in your heart after hearing the word of God and hope building in you and the hope for that word to come to pass in your life or in the life of those you're agreeing with. And as faith as, as uh, faith and hope mix, then the promise can be conceived. Hallelujah. And that pro and, and we're, I see it in my own life. Do you see it in yours? I've seen it in many other many others. Lives. Do you see it in yours? Do you want to see it in yours? Do you want to continue to see it in yours, in your life and in the life of you of those you love and those around you? It will happen. If you will believe, and if you will speak and declare faith. And so uh, I wanted to as well show that uh, the consequences, of course, to agreeing outside the promises of God, right? And so in the same chapter, going down to verse 8, and the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar. Didn't see Hagar. She saw the son of Hagar. And God had opened her eyes and allowed her to see the son of Hagar, who is Ishmael, uh, Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham laughing so she saw ishmael laughing um maybe through you know the this feast and maybe laughing at what it represented not sure exactly but she saw him laughing now uh verse 10 so she said to abraham cast out this slave woman with her son for the son of this slave woman shall not be heir with my son, Isaac. Wow. And this is so important to grasp a hold of. You see, she had come on board in such a tremendous way, 180 degree turn. Uh, originally, she had given Abraham Hagar, her handmaiden, to, to bear a child in in her name and in his name, in Sarah's name and in 
I, and in Abraham's name, because she just could not see it. She just couldn't believe it. And she knew I, and she just thought, you know, Abraham just really wants a son that he's seeing that God is talking to him. He wants it so bad that he's hearing voices. So she said, I, you know, let me help my husband here go for it you know and this is this was something that was not unusual actually in that time this is something that they did in those times um and so they would give the handmaiden the handmaiden as the servant would bear the child but would bear it in the name of um of the of of their you know their uh, masters and so and so it was done but here we see that first of all, she needed the faith to conceive. Next, she was so on board. She's saying now that Isaac is the promise. This is who God promised. This is who God will create many nations through. And if Ishmael is here, he will rightfully take that birthright. It is his birthright because he was Abraham's firstborn. And if uh, if Abraham does not sort of, I guess, kind of like uh, separate himself from Ishmael and Hagar, I the promise of God could not be fulfilled. And so here's grace. You see, grace, this is how grace works is that, uh, you know, we live our lives and we've lived our lives outside of the promises of God. We've made decisions outside the promises of God. Um, we've done things outside of the will of God, maybe by fear or doubt or whatever it is, even as Christians. But here's the grace and mercy of God to turn it around, to bring you into faith, to bring you in to the promise through repentance, through deliverance, through cleansing and, and, uh, and restoration, restoring what was done in error, what was done um, in rebellion, what was done in uh, unbelief. And now you can come full circle and come, come on board 100%. This is the grace and the mercy of God. It's the same with Sarah, and it's the same with us today. Be encouraged that God wants to fulfill his promises in you. And that you will take it on. It will be 100% yours. You will buy into it 100%. And you will even defend it. Defend the faith defend the promises of God through what you say and how you live and so now what's I mean and this is so funny because you know in verse 11 and the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son now in another account it, it says that he gives Sarah and I think we read it that he gave Sarah the, the right to choose you know they were having a disagreement in the other account and and Abraham says you decide you know you decide what do you want you know and so he but here we see uh they they make they emphasize the fact that Abraham is not in agreement with his wife in the beginning so in verse 7 but God said to Abraham Okay, so sorry, 11. And the thing was very displeasing to Abraham on account of his son. And it would be so, I feel that it was so uh, displeasing that he would have gone back on his word to his wife to say, you know, okay, you know what? I can't do it. I can't do it. I understand how you feel, but I just can't do it. It's not right. I don't see that it's right. Right. And so, how now do we reconcile the two the two ideas the two desires right in fact sarah is right 
And so she is standing on the side of right. Abraham is acting out of his fleshly obligation, but more so his love for his son. I believe he loved Ishmael in such a great way and felt responsible for him and the and making sure that he was well and that he was good he was okay and that he was taken care of and he did not want to put him out and so we can identify with that we can we can see that and we can side with abraham and and understand that father's heart and so god had to intervene it was very important because it could not the muddy the water could not be muddied and isaac couldn't i mean um uh, abraham could not go back on his word and so in verse 12 he says god but god but god said to abraham be not displeased because of the boy and because of your slave woman whatever sarah says to you do as she tells you for through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Sometimes these decisions are not easy. Sometimes it's more comfortable to work out of what we know or what we feel is right. Our emotions get in the way. Our flesh gets in the way of doing what God desires us to do and what is actually right in God's eyes. Um, and and so how do we come into alignment with God? And first of all, yes, we do need to hear from him. And we're going to see that. Um, and, so, uh, and so 14. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar. You feel that his heart is heavy putting it on her shoulder, but he wanted to take the responsibility. He didn't get anybody else to do it. He took the responsibility along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Uh, that's not the end of the story, though. Um, I want to continue on with this because, I, again, the consequences come to the decision. So that's one consequence that Abraham, his heart, feels like it's it's hurting right now and that's one consequence of acting on our own uh on our own will and on our own strength and our own desires is that it's very hard to put those things aside even when we know what is right verse 15 when the water when the water in the skin was gone she put the child under one of the bushes then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, let me not look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, what troubles you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Up, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water and she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took a wife for him from the land of Egypt. And, and so we see that God, again, in his mercy, but you know, it, the story still doesn't end there. You know, it's, it seems like a happy ending, but it's not. Uh, the flesh has, will give trouble um, in so many ways. And so if you turn to Psalms 83, 1 to 15, you're going to see the trouble that was caused because of the flesh of Abraham. Now, Psalms 83, 1 to 15, he says here, Oh God, do not keep silence. This is um, I believe it's David writing, and he says, Do not hold your peace or be still, O God, for behold, your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have raised their heads. 
They lay crafty plans against your people. They consult together against your treasured ones. They say, come let us wipe them out as a nation. Man, are we not seeing that even on our even today uh, or, or this week in the news, we're seeing the the devastation um, in the nation of Israel and, and Palestine, the the loss of life, the loss of property, destruction of property. It, it's just sad. They say, "Come, let us wipe them out as a nation. Let the name of Israel be remembered no more." For they conspire with one accord against you. They make a covenant. David's trying to draw God's attention to that. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites. Guess who the Ishmaelites are? <laughs> They're descendants of Ishmael. Moab and the Hagrites. Guess who the Hagrites are? They're descendants of Hagar. Uh, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek. Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyr. Asher, Asher also has joined them. They are the strong arm of the children of Lot. Selah, do to them as you did to Midian, as to Caesarea, as to Sisera and Jabin at the river Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became dung for the ground. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, um, who said, let us take possession for ourselves of the pastures of God. Oh, my God, make them like whirling dust like chafe before the wind, as fire consumes the forest, as the flame sets the mountains ablaze, so may you pursue them with your tempest and terrify them with your hurricane. Uh, so because of Abraham's flesh, David now has to pray this prayer and seek deliverance from Ishmael or the Ishmaelites or the Hagarites or and all these other guys, all these other ites. So the flesh and acting on the flesh is has consequences and very severe consequences. You might not see it right away, but down the road, it will affect not only you, but those around you, even your descendants. Let's... Um, and so we see the consequences of this. So how do we avoid this? How do we, how do we not agree to the wrong thing? How do we avoid agreeing to the wrong things? Because we need to agree. We need to come together. We need to unite. We need, there needs to be harmony and peace in our lives, in our relationships, in the church. How do we find it? Let's let's look at Acts 1, 1 to 8. Let's have a look. What does God say? Because it's important for us to know what God says, what God wants, how God will provide that peace and that unity and that agreement. Uh, Acts 1, 1 to 8, he says here in the first book, O Theophilus. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Very important. Jesus taught what they heard and why they're doing what they're doing is because they heard what Jesus said. And Jesus commanded them through the Holy Spirit. Verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Verse 4, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Verse 5, for John baptized with water but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so not only did Jesus speak to them through the Holy Spirit, not only did he command them through the Holy Spirit, but now he's saying that that same spirit that he speaks from, the same 
uh, through the same spirit that empowers him, his words, his actions, his deeds. They are going to be baptized in and with the same spirit. This is crucial. This is crucial because we need to know that our belief uh, goes beyond knowing what Jesus did <clears throat> and what he performed and his obedience and what he spoke. That that same spirit that he did all of those things, he is now baptizing his church today, his body today. All those who will believe, right? Uh, in verse 6, he says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. This is, the, this is another crucial verse. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. When it says witnesses in Jerusalem, it's not simply saying, oh, we saw his works in Jerusalem. It's not only that. What it is, is that they will be performing the works of Christ. And they will allow people to witness the Holy Spirit working in them and through them. That's what it means when he says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. You're going to be my, my people that go out. You're going to evangelize and go out. And the commandment that I spoke to you when I said, go out into all the world and preach the gospel, cast out devils, heal the sick. And when you pick up any deadly thing, it will not harm you. They are going, people will witness the truth and that promise coming to pass in their lives and through them. Acts 2, 1 to 21. Acts 2, 22, 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared uh, to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, verse 5. I, I want to speak to that in a second. Now, verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia. And, and this is far reaching. Asia, they're talked about, right? This is, uh, this is far, far reaching. Um, Phrygia and Camphylia, Egypt, so all the way to Africa, and the parts of Libya belonging to Syri Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked, saying, others mocking said they are filled with new wine. And so um, I, I want to say that in this day and age, people have the faith to believe. There are people, when you talk to Pentecostals, they do believe that they uh, indwell or they can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Um, a lot of times I don't see the faith going beyond talking in tongues um, or the understanding is not there. They, they might not put the two together. 
um, that the Holy Spirit is working not just so that they can talk in tongues. The tongues are just a, 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 a manifestation of the Spirit of God being present so that those around you know that the Holy Spirit is in within you. Um, uh, also, it's not just a matter of you uh, it, using the Holy Spirit to feel good and to dance and, and to rejoice. Uh, that, that is one aspect that is so enjoyable about having the Holy Spirit indwell in you. It brings such, uh, such pleasure, such enjoyment, such, um, you know, you feel one uh, in the Spirit of God with God. And so it brings such confidence and such joy um, that it, it's hard, it's even hard to explain it. And unless you've experienced it, it's hard for you to understand it. So. Uh, we just, I just encourage you to seek God to be, uh, to make sure that you're walking in the Spirit, to make sure that you're walking in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, sorry, I read that, verse 14 now, but Peter, it's the same chapter, uh, chapter 2, but Peter standing with the 11 lifted up his voice, um, uh, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. So he's reminding those who are Jewish, who, who, are, who were raised on the Talmud and so on and so forth, you know, the the uh, words that were written down uh, that they study and that they they go to temple to listen to uh, he's reminding Peter's reminding them because they would have known this right or they would have reviewed this maybe several times but not putting the two together not understanding not seeing it come uh, to fruition but now they're seeing it right in verse 17 here he's he's reciting that he says and in the last days it shall be god declares that i will pour out my spirit on all flesh this is the prophecy from joel so many centuries before or at least decades and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. This is a great day. This is a great day. And so, you know, the scriptures are coming to pass and are being fulfilled in their time right before their very eyes. And Peter is help, trying to help them by the, by the Holy Spirit to understand what is happening right there at that moment, right in front of their very eyes and the fulfillment of scripture right there. Verse 19, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. This is the continuation of the prophecy by Joel. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. Verse 21, and it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God. And another fantastic and beautiful promise to call on the name of the lord and be saved and so i i wanted to point that out because i think it's important that we understand the scripture and understand what's happening and and look for signs that the scriptures are ha happening in front of you look for signs that the scriptures are happening within you look for them um, and desire them when you hear the scriptures and you hear the promise, hope should arise. The hope and desire that those promises will need to come to pass in your life. You need to desire them first, right? And then you need to have the faith to believe that they're going to come to pass in your life. And to, as it were, as Sarah did, conceive the promise. Conceive the promise today. I encourage you to conceive that promise that the Lord has spoken to you. Verse uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Um, 
to First uh, Corinthians seven verse seven. So here uh, is Paul speaking, and in verse nineteen he says, "Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body." In other words, you have the choice to to live for God to allow the spirit of God to work in you and through you and to give you, to empower you, empower you to live the word of God, to live according to the word of God, to live a righteous and a holy life, um, as well as fulfill those promises in your life. Now, uh, he goes on to say here, um, verse, first Corinthians uh, chapter seven now, and uh, oh, sorry, uh, First Corinthians chapter seven, verse one. Now he says, "Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman." So here, I want I, I the Lord wants us to know how how important you know where is our desire, where is our focus. Are you focused on the Lord? Do you understand that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you, want, do you receive the Holy Spirit today? Do you allow him to um, guide your life, to instruct you? Do you follow his instruction? Do you look for it? Are you, are you giving him deference? Are you uh, saying that his word is more important than your desire? Are you saying that? Have you committed your life 100% to him? Have you, uh, how much do you desire him to uh, work in your life and to, uh, to take full control of your life? Well, look at what Paul says. Paul is one who lived this way. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual morality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Uh, now as a concession, not a command, I say this, and this is Paul still writing, I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one, one, of one kind and one of another. And so it's not a law, it's not a command, but he's encouraging us to live like him. And even if you're married, does, it does not say that you cannot live um, in, in that place of faith, in that place of agreement with the Holy Spirit, in that oneness with the Holy Spirit, in uh, having the Holy Spirit direct your life every day. Doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean that. And in fact, uh, the opposite is true. It, it might be a little more challenging because you know you have a spouse and you have children and so on and so forth. It might be a little more challenging, but uh, you know you need you need to rely on the Spirit of God to direct you and to empower you. You can do it. Um, but those who are not married. How can you have that focus? How can you have that devoutness? All right, it's the Holy Spirit that will empower you to do it. But you have to have that desire. You have to have that hope. You have to allow faith to arise in your heart. And even as the song said, Lord, I need you. We need to be desperate for God. We need to understand that we are a people that are wanton, that we, without Christ, we are, you know, we're, we're nothing. We, we don't, we can't do it. We can't live this Christian life um, without 
Christ in our lives and the Holy Spirit working, we live a depraved life. Um, Gal Galatians 5, 16 to 18. Galatians 5, 16 to 18. And, and uh, he says here, but I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh for the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law and you're not under the law of the flesh, in other words, and the control of the flesh the flesh does not control you your desires do not control you it is the holy spirit that controls and directs your life if you will allow and if you desire it galatians 2 20 i have been crucified with christ and here's the point where we need to get to galatians 2 20 i have been crucified with christ it is no longer i who live but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how you're going to live this life. You need to crucify yourself with Christ. Uh, in other words, you know that Christ crucified uh, was crucified. You know that he gave up his life. Nobody took it. He gave it up willingly in obedience to the Father and in love for us. And now, for those who follow after Christ, who, for those who believe in Christ, they need to take that step further, right? Not just believe that he did it for them. Not just believe that he, um, he, wants, that, that he uh, mended the gap or uh, mended the bridge that that was broken between man and God through sin, Christ mended that gap and mended the bridge, and now we have direct access to heaven. That's not enough, right? Because we know this, now we need to take the step further and understand that we are crucifying ourselves, crucifying the flesh. Don't allow the flesh to live in such a way that it controls your life and that it takes preeminence over the voice and desires of the spirit of God. It must be the spirit of God that directs your life, but you have to decide. And God is putting you to a, a choice. He puts it, puts you to a choice because you cannot, um, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve the flesh and you cannot serve God at the same time. You will be double-minded. You will be unstable in all your ways. And God says, and he's putting it to you even today, choose, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Will you serve your flesh or are you going to serve God? Those moments that you're serving your flesh, you're at enmity with God. You're at hatred. You're, at, you're divided, separate from God. God will have no part in your flesh. Choose today. Romans 1, 16 to 25. Um, we're going to, uh, let me just go through this. Uh, Romans 1, 16, 25, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. God's wrath on righteousness, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, in verse 18, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth for what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. 
And so I've always said that scientists have some great studies. They're very committed, very dedicated to studying, you know, nature and to studying the world around us and how things work. But it's God who created it all. And so let us not focus on creation, on the creation, but focus on the creator. None of them knowing how things work can make them or make them even work. Only God can. And by his word, he spoke it into existence. That's his eternal power and divine nature. Um, claiming to be. So in verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Romans 4, 11 to 12. I'm just going to go through these quickly and give you these. And, and um, uh, there's, there's quite a bit still. Uh, okay. You know, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. Um, if there's time in another time, or if God brings me back to this uh, the next time, then I will continue. Um, otherwise, I, I trust that you are encouraged today to be desperate for God. Um, see the hope that is in the word and in the promises of God and desire them for your own self and your own loved ones, family and those around you. And allow faith to rise in your heart so that you can conceive the promises and bring the word to life in your own heart and life. And that is the most exciting life you could possibly live. That is the most exciting life you could possibly live, whether you're married or not. <laughs> and so uh, thank you so much for being here together and um, for allowing the spirit of God to have his way in your heart, in your life, and in your mind. Let me just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. Lord Jesus, oh God, we love you so much. Father God, I pray that each person, as they hear the word, Father God, it will see the hope in your promises, and Father God, desire them. Desire you more even than the promises that they can have that closeness with you, that relationship with you. Father God, that you understand and, and let them come to understand that you are the treasure today and that having you is greater than any possession that they can possess, especially on this, on this earth in this life. And Father God, help us to express your love that you feel for us, help us to res res uh, um, express it back to you and to those around us. And Lord God, we'll be pleased to give you the praise, all the glory. It, it's, it's only you and only you deserve it. And we thank you for it. 